Hi, I'm Carlton Coffrin. In this video, I'm going to tell you a bit about our work benchmarking a D-Wave quantum computer to established binary quadratic programming solution methods. Now, there's a variety of different things you can do with a D-Wave quantum computer. In this particular work, we're focusing on the optimization task. Basically, we're using the computer to solve binary quadratic programs, or Cubo problems. And the reason that we're interested in this is that in general these problems are NP-hard combinatorial optimization problems, so it may be very interesting um, to use some specialized hardware to solve them. Now it's important to note that state-of-the-art optimization algorithms have been developed for these particular methods uh, based on decades of research and development in algorithms. So we're trying to ask this question, are those state-of-the-art algorithms faster or slower than this custom D-Wave hardware? And if the D-Wave hardware can outperform them, that would be a really interesting development because it would mean the specialized hardware has effectively leapfrogged decades of R&D. But it's also important to note that these tools are very highly developed and um, are very mature. So it's a very significant task to say that you can outperform them. Now, before we get into exactly what we did, let's talk a little bit about uh, a preferable situation for benchmarking optimization algorithms. The typical situation is that you take your problem of interest, let's say protein folding for an example, which is an important and impactful problem, and then you go through the literature and you find the state-of-the-art algorithm for solving that particular problem, you implement it and it produces some particular result. Now you do your research to develop a D-Wave-based algorithm for solving the same problem, and it produces a particular result. And then at the end, you can say, you can compare and contrast the results and say, okay, which one of these two things is better? Now, the reason why this is a nice approach is that the claim you want to make is that on this particular problem, the D-Wave algorithm you have built is the state-of-the-art method for solving this problem. And effectively, the ends justify the means. You know, it doesn't really matter why it's the state-of-the-art algorithm. You just know that it produces the best solutions we know of now. So, this is the typical way that we do benchmarking of optimization algorithms in the literature. So in our previous work, which you can watch a detailed video about all of this, um, I took that approach. We took test cases from the quadratic programming library and the dimax max clique cases, which are established, well-studied, known to be difficult, and interesting test cases that come from a variety of different sources. And we attempted to solve them using the D-Wave quantum computer. Now, the challenge here is that these particular problems have an arbitrary structure to them. This pink graph shows you um, each node is a particular variable in the problem, and each edge is if two variables interact with each other. You can see that the structure is, you know, whatever the problem decreed, it's fairly arbitrary. But on the, in the D-Wave hardware, we have a very specific structure, which is imposed by how the chip is made. And so there's a challenging problem you face where you have to take your problem of interest and embed it onto the D-Wave hardware. Now the results of this work was that this embedding step basically caused a failure of our analysis. Uh, it, any problem which was challenging for off-the-shelf tools, uh, we could not embed it onto this hardware using the established embedding algorithms. Um, so in this work, we're taking a very different approach, and it's really just a stopgap measure until this embedding issue can be resolved. We have a collection of, of BQP solvers on the left, and then we have our D-Wave quantum computing chip on the right. What we're going to do is build a problem generator, which takes as input the hardware graph from the D-Wave quantum computer and produces an interesting test case um, randomly, uh, then, that then we can send to all of these different tools. And the key point here is that because we use the hardware to generate the problem, we can just skip the embedding step entirely and put the problem right onto the hardware. So there are some problems with doing problem generation. So it's very important that we go into this area with caution. A first big question is how hard are the randomly generated problems? There are some combinatorial optimization problems where generating uh, problems at random creates super hard cases. There are other problems where generating um, test cases at random produces very easy problems. So it's not at all obvious when you're generating a problem if it's a hard or easy problem to solve. 
And for more detail about that, you could look at the lessons learned from the random satisfaction community. Um, for example, this 1992 paper from AAAI, where they look at how different methods for generating random problems can either make them incredibly easier or incredibly hard. And there's actually um, uh, a very small window or a set of parameters where they're very hard. To give you some intuition for how challenging it can be to make uh, hard and easy test cases, I want you to look briefly at these two inputs that you could give to a D-Wave quantum computer. Basically, um, the red edges mean that two variables want to take a different value, and the blue mean that they want to take the same value. Now, from my eye, these look very similar. But actually, this is the hardest case that we, or class of case that we found, and this is the easiest case that we found. Um, in technical terms, the one on the left is a super frustrated system, and the one on the right is a ferromagnet in disguise, um, if you're familiar with those terms. And uh, the fascinating thing to me is, from my perspective, these are totally indistinguishable. So this gives you some um, insight into how difficult it can be to generate random problems. So we have this challenge, how are we going to generate hard or interesting random D-Wave cases? And essentially what we're going to do is just look to the literature and do what they've been doing. So I'm going to go through a number of problem generators uh, that were proposed in the literature. The first one is what we'll call the RAN-K case. Basically, the field on the chip is set to zero. And then you just set the couplers at random. Um, and you use k discrete steps to set the couplers. So in the example here, it's just minus 1 and plus 1. Um, so it's a 1, but you know it could be many steps. And there's a citation here if you want to read more about this particular problem. We also are going to look at what we call RAN-FK, which is the exact same problem except now we're going to set the field of each uh, variable at random as well. Another popular problem in literature is a so-called frustrated loop. Basically, what you're going to do is find random cycles in the network, and then you're going to add one edge of frustration um, to each cycle, and then you're going to overlay multiple cycles. And this has a nice property that you can um, it preserves the lowest energy state, so you know based on how you set it up, what the lowest, um, what the best possible solution to this problem is. Another one that's been um, recently studied is a so-called frustrated cluster loop, where basically each one of the unit cells of eight bits is linked together with um, strong coupling, so all the bits want to take the same value. Um, and then the, each one of these clusters is then linked together with um, these frustrated cycles. Um, so that, that has been studied recently as well. And then um, there was another paper which studied this so-called weak strong cluster networks. The idea here is that you, make for, you take two adjacent unit cells and you give them a different kind of uh, structure. You can see that some of them have a, a strong field one way and a, and a strong field the other way. And they're all linked together and they want to take the same value, so they're kind of fighting with each other. And then these two unit cells that are connected together, which you see circled in red, are connected with random sets of edges. The blue blocks are connected at random. So that's the weak strong cluster network problem. If you would like a more detailed description, please go to the original papers. So now we have the interesting question. We have test cases that we can generate using these established generation algorithms, and we have a pile of different solvers we might use to solve these test cases. So what would be the fairest comparison? In this particular course on Coursera, which I co-teach, we describe different classes of optimization algorithms like this. You have global optimization algorithms like dynamic programming and constraint programming and integer programming, um, which usually work very well for small problem sizes but don't scale very well. Then you have local search type of algorithms, which scale very well but may not give you the absolute best answer possible. And then most of the state-of-the-art research these days is around doing hybridizations of, the, of both of these approaches. So a tool like Garobi, for example, is a mixed integer programming solver, which fits into, into this blue box. Uh, things like simulated annealing or taboo search fit into this local search box. And then um, meta heuristics like this HFS heuristic, which we're going to consider here, is fits into this hybrid box. It's a little bit of both. So the question is, where does D-Wave fit? And I don't think that this uh, question has been answered in, like, 
closed for, for all cer certainty, but uh, the literature tends to suggest that it's fair to compare D-Wave to um, hybrid algorithms and local search algorithms. So ultimately, um, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to pick actually three different solvers, uh, Grobi, HFS, and the D-Wave algorithm. Um, and the interesting thing here is that we're sampling from all these different spaces. Now, before I go into some details, uh, I think it's important to review how does a solver like Grobi work and how does it, can it give you a guarantee on the best optimal solution? So if you think of, uh, you have in an optimization problem an objective function, you're trying to find the lowest cost solution or the lowest energy solution, what a tool like Grobi does is it searches for better and better solutions. So at every point in time as it's running, you kind of, you have a, the best solution you've found so far. This is called the upper bound. At the same time, it's also computing a lower bound on that particular solution, which is going up and up and up. And at some point, in finite time, but potentially exponential time, they will converge, and then you'll have essentially have a proof of optimality, that the solution you found is the absolute best one you could ever have. Now, because this can be exponential time in practice, typically what we do is we set a particular time limit. In this work, the time limit we've set is 10 minutes. And so at any point in time, you have this upper and lower bound, and you can measure how what's the gap between them. So this gives you a measure of how close you are to the potential optimal solution. So that's how Grobi works. How does the HFS solver work? Um, it was proposed in this particular archive report and then also was implemented um, by Shelby in this GitHub repository. And essentially what it does is you start with a graph um, that has a particu like, particular structure and you design low tree worth with subgraphs. So here you can see there's kind of like a comb shape um, with a very low tree width. And what you do is use dynamic programming, which is going to scale based on the tree width. Uh, it should be a polynomial in the tree width. Um, you optimize the, one of these subgraphs, and then you get the best configuration, and then you pick another subgraph, and you optimize that, and you iterate this back and forth until you hit either um, some kind of time limit or convergence criteria. For the D-Wave algorithm, uh, what we're going to do is we have to convert, you know, what the D-Wave does, which gives you a pile of assignments of the solutions into an optimization algorithm. So what we're doing is we're taking, we're asking the computer to give us 10,000 different um, assignments of the variables and doing an annealing for five microseconds for each of those samples. We do a random gauge transformation every 100 samples. And then at the end of the run, we return just the best solution that we've get, we get. Now, when you don't include the time it takes to send a message out to the D-Wave computer and send it back, this entire process takes about 3.5 seconds. So that is uh, roughly the runtime that we see on the actual hardware. Now, I'm going to take a moment to make a little diversion about a number of open source tools that we developed as part of this project. So up until now, the way that most of us have developed algorithms for the D-Wave is we take our problem of interest, we use an um, API like the solver API provided by D-Wave, and we prepare the data and send it to the D-Wave hardware. As part of this particular problem, we've developed a pipeline that looks like this. We have their D-Wave instance generator, which takes the D-Wave as input. Um, then we have our uh, BQP JSON, which is a data format that's independent of any particular uh, solver for these types of problems. And then we have a, another repository of BQP solvers, which is essentially the glue code to take a BQP JSON file and send it to all of these different tools that you might want to try to solve it on. So um, I have to set, give special thanks to Scott for getting the, um, the ability to post this stuff outside of LANL. So you can go and check um, all of the source code for these different types of tools at the links uh, provided here. So what I would recommend if you're interested in benchmarking tools is not to go directly through SAPI, but actually to model your problem as a BQG, BQP JSON file and then send it, use this BQP solvers to send it to a variety of different tools. This way you can fo focus on formulating your problem and then you can very quickly uh, swap out which tool you're using to solve your problem. Okay, now we've done with all the introductory stuff. 
It's time to have some fun. Let's compare a bunch of these different instances on these three different algorithms. Now let me tell you a little bit about the structure of this benchmark study. We have five different problem classes which were previously introduced. The first step we're going to do is try to determine which of these problems is actually challenging. So we're going to use Garobi as kind of like the baseline established um, tool and we're going to say how fast is all, are all these different problems on Garobi. Then based on which ones are actually difficult, we're going to build a test suite of so-called hard problems, and then we're going to run all of those problems on HFS, Garobi, and D-Wave. So let's do our problem hardness test. For this particular test, we're going to use the entire chip, which is a C12 size chip, and we're going to use uh, a timeout on Garobi of 10 minutes. This is a histogram which is showing you how much time Garobi took to um, prove optimality, and then also which particular problems we have and how many problems were sampled. So we've taken over 40,000 different cases. We did a parameter sweep of all the parameters of those particular problems. Um, and you can see each bar in the histogram is showing you a particular type of problem. So the interesting thing here is that for all of the problems we studied for weak strong cluster network, frustrated loop, or frustrated cluster loop, uh, they, they took less than 10 seconds for Garobi to find the optimal solution and prove that it's optimal. So I would argue that these are fairly easy cases. If you can find the optimal solution to a problem in less than 10 seconds, uh, it doesn't seem particularly challenging. Now in contrast, the, both the RAN-K and RAN-FK problems took the time limit of 10 minutes and weren't able to prove optimality usually within that time. So these do seem to be potentially challenging or interesting cases. So let's drill into those and understand them a little better. Um, in particular, what values of k, you know, how does it affect it? Does it make them harder or easier? So for this particular uh, study, um, where we're looking at the hardness of k in the RAND problems, we're going to use the Garobi optimization tool, but we're only going to um, solve a C5 size graph. And the reason is, is that in about 10 minutes, we can get an optimality proof on all of the inputs of this. So the total runtime of Garobi will be a good measure of how hard the case is. Now, it's important to note that even at this size, this is a non-trivial problem. We're talking like 10 to the 58 combinations if you are going to brute force it. So this is not a trivial task for Garobi to optimize anyway. So here are two histograms, which are showing you the total runtime of Groovy, and then broken down by which value of k, um, or the value of k in a particular input. So what can we notice about this? The first thing that we can observe is that the RAN cases seem to be much more challenging than the RAN F cases, because at the end we have like 80 seconds versus 600 seconds. Uh, the other thing that we can notice is that the blue bars seem to be the ones that take the most time, and so those are where k is equal to 1. And that seems to be consistent across both cases. And this doesn't actually surprise me because usually when the combinatorics of your problem is challenging is when it is the most challenging problem, uh, and so when k is equal to 1, you have the biggest combinatorial effects in this particular problem. Now, humorously, after doing this whole big study, Basically, all I have determined is that these three guys who I met in the bar about a year ago are really know what they're talking about. Um, I was lamenting to them that I was having difficulty finding hard problems to study, and they suggested that I just try setting all the couplers to minus one and one at random, and it turns out that that is pretty much the hardest problem that we've been able to identify so far. So let's focus in on a detailed study of this RAN1 case uh, because it is the um, uh, seems to be the most challenging one. I've conducted a similar study for the RAN F case, and the results are similar. They're just uh, the run times are just faster, so um, you can keep that in mind as well. So, how are we going to design this detailed study? We're we're going to have two parts. First, in part one, we're going to focus on the C5 graph. And the reason for that is that we can do some quality validation on all of the tools. Because Garobi can prove the global optimal solution on these particular problems, we can compare the best, no, the best possible solution to both the D-Wave and the HS, HFS algorithm. 
In part two, basically what we're going to do is wishful extrapolation. We're going to say, well, if the things that we learned in part one still hold true, you know, this is the performance trend of D-Wave and HSF in part two on using the full chip that we have. So I showed this picture to you before. This is how Gorobi works. Here is what that same picture looks like on real data. So I'll just walk you through exactly everything that's going on in this figure. First off, what we're seeing is the average uh, objective value uh, over 200 randomly generated cases. So the key point here is that there's some variance around the mean, which is the solid line, but that variance isn't from the algorithm. It's because we're considering a, a 200 randomly generated cases. And you can even observe that as things go to optimality, this gap still uh, exists. The next important thing to note is this is a logarithmic scale. So we're looking at at least six orders of magnitude here in runtime. When Gorobi converges, when the lower bound and the upper bound converge, we have an optimality proof for all 200 cases. So essentially the black line in this figure is the average objective value of, of all the solution, all the problems solved to global optimality. And then uh, at this particular scale, you can see that both the HFS and the D-Wave algorithms are totally indis indistinguishable and they're very fast. So let's zoom in and see if we can see some further detail if we just focus on these two particular algorithms. So now we've just rescaled the figure to around those two algorithms. Now it's important to note that we're looking at four orders of magnitude of runtime from one um, hundredth of a second to ten seconds and HFS is always producing the global optimal solution. We know this because Garobi proved it with much more time. But you can see it's just a solid line that doesn't waver at all. You can also see that when the D-Wave has between 5,000 and 10,000 samples, it's pretty much finding opt all of the time as well. So um, that's very encouraging. Now, you might think that when you have less samples on the D-Wave, it's getting a lot worse than HFS because there's this big spike on the left of the um, diagram. But it's important to also pay attention to what is the scale of the objective value in this plot. Um, the difference between the absolute best value and uh, the worst value that's on this plot is less than 1%. It's 0.4%. So actually, uh, you might argue that the differences between all these solutions are negligible, and uh, they're basically equivalent. So now let's look if we use our entire chip, which is a C12, what the results look like. Uh, what you can see here is that even after 10 minutes of computation, Garobi has not converged, it's not produced uh, a global optimality proof, and there's a significant gap in, um, between the lower bound and the upper bound that it, it's computed. Again, on Garobi scale, D-Wave and HFS are indistinguishable, but if we zoom in, now we see some, something that's a bit more interesting. Um, basically, what you can see here is that as the runtime increases to about 10 seconds, it looks like the HFS algorithm is converging on a globally optimal solution. That, that plateau seems to suggest that. Um, the next thing to observe is that as you reduce the runtime for HFS, the quality of the solution gets worse and worse and worse. The same is true for D-Wave when you reduce the number of samples, but at, there is no point where the D-Wave line and the HFS line cross. So this means that basically no matter how you configure it, as long as they have the same amount of time, HFS will produce a better solution. Once again, I think it's very important to pay attention to this energy scale here. The numbers have gotten a lot bigger, but the relative difference is actually not so much. So again, the relative difference between all these values is less than 1%, it's 0.3%. And so I would argue that these differences are probably negligible. You probably should be asking yourself questions like, well, are the coefficients that I put into my problem accurate enough that this uh, level of difference in the objective value even uh, makes sense? So we have one more study we're going to conduct, and that is one where we start with a very small chip and then we make it bigger and bigger and bigger up until we get to the C12 size. And the goal here is to understand what is the scalability properties of these three algorithms as you increase the problem size. 
So in this picture, what you're seeing is the number of qubits that are in our particular problem, and then the average energy of uh, 200 samples run for that a, a chip of that particular size. So on the left, you can see that basically all the lines are on top of each other. This means that D-Wave, HFS, and Garobi all agree. These are the globally optimal solutions, and, um, and that's the best you can do. Then when you get to, say, around uh, 200 bits, then Garobi stops being able to find the best possible solution, and the lower bound starts to degrade as well. Um, but as the qubits increase further and further, um, D-Wave and HFS produce similar results. Now at the extreme, which we just studied in detail, uh, the D-Wave, there's a, a kind of a slowly growing gap between HFS and the D-Wave's um, results. And so like the last two points on this plot is actually the results of, uh, that we just studied in detail in the last set of slides. So the big question is, you know, what's going to happen as things go further out? Um, I think that's a very interesting question no one knows the answer to, but I'll just speculate based on my understanding of what these algorithms do. I expect that as n gets larger and larger, the HFS algorithm will continue to increase. The reason is that um, it's essentially a dynamic programming algorithm, so we expect it to have some kind of a, a polynomial type of curve, so at least quadratic. Um, possibly higher, so you would expect it to kind of curve up eventually. I expect that the D-Wave will continue to go up a little bit, but at a much slower pace. The reason being that this is a customized piece of hardware, so the total runtime and performance seems to be fairly st steady as the problem size increases. The main limiting factor is just how big a chip can you make. So then the interesting question is, where would these things cross? You know, maybe it's when you get to C16, maybe it's when you get to C20. I don't think anyone knows, and it's an interesting question to continue studying in the future. Now, I'm going to begin to wrap up, but before uh, I do, I want to make a word of caution about this RAN1 case. The fact that there, the relative difference in energy between the best solutions that we're seeing out of HFS and the worst solutions that we're seeing out of HFS is about 1%. Um, and we, we see this property for the D-Wave as well. That is a little bit of a worrisome fact. Uh, it would suggest that this problem has many, many nearly equal local minima. And that property is not desirable for benchmarking heuristics like simulated annealing or taboo search or HFS. The reason being they have a very high probability of finding a very good solution. You want it to be very hard to find the good solution and you want to get stuck in local minima but have very big deep local minima um, that are very difficult to find and it doesn't look like this particular case has that property. So I would argue that um, a very pressing issue is that more work is needed to design challenging test cases uh, that are hard for both um, complete methods like Garobi and local search methods like HFS, simulated nailing, and taboo search. So I'll just uh, conclude with a few thoughts that I've learned from this study. The first major uh, point that I've seen is that it seems that all of the popular test cases from literature are relatively easy. Either they're solved very quickly by Garobi or they're solved very quickly by HFS. So um, that's a little bit surprising. The second thing is that um, it seems like our D-Wave 2X chip is reliable for well-studied um, optimization applications like max cut. Um, it, I wouldn't say it, it is at the point where it would outpace a classical algorithm, but it does seem um, pros promising. So it's something to uh, look forward to as the chips grow in size. So um, it would be very interesting to repeat this study on a 2000Q um, D-Wave quantum computer to see if uh, if things have gotten better for the D-Wave analysis. Overall, uh, this study has been very interesting, but I think that we still have more questions than answers about how to use this hardware effectively to do optimization. Um, but it's very exciting, and I hope that research will continue. I'll conclude with a uh, special thanks to Ryan from um, the providing access to the Darwin cluster. This uh, project required 
thousands of days worth of classical computation, including thousands of jobs running on the D-Wave computer. So it, it would not have been possible without having a classical computing cluster. Thank you very much for listening, and please uh, contact me if you have any questions.